was sad that I couldn't hear the question. Yes. So yes. give me a, give me a chance to get to you and put the mic in front of you. And yeah. And Matt will turn the mic on when I get to you, and we'll go from there. Yeah. And it also helps if people in the front rows ask questions, the people in the back rows cannot hear it. So then the answer is out of context. So. Uh, okay, we're going to get started at 6.30. So my name is Pastor Kathy Howison, and you may be wondering why I'm here instead of Pastor Carl. The short answer is he asked me to be. Uh, the longer answer is I am a retired ELCA pastor with the emphasis on retired, but I know how important it is that pastors have some life beyond the congregation, that they take their time off, they take their vacations, they tend to their family and their friends, and so one of my retirement projects is when I am available, I will fill in for them so they can go off. So uh, you're getting the B team tonight, which explains why your handout is upside down on the backside. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, this is my mistake, not Gabrielle's. I, she did what I asked her to do, and I did not ask her to include the readings for tonight. So you don't have those, but I will read them when we get to them. So, uh, so with that, uh, I have a, a prayer that I pulled actually from the Gather magazine. We used it at a circle meeting the other day, and I've edited a little bit for our situation, but I thought it really fit what we were trying to do. So let us pray. Oh God, our compassionate companion, you walk beside us through life's joys and sorrows. When we suffer, you are with us. We ask that you heal all who are living with problems, with rejection, with confusion. Help us to be your hands and feet in this world, to turn our prayers into action. We recognize that our biblical ancestors also face challenges and confusion and at times rejection. Today, as our society continues to evolve and think of new ways to think about old, old situations, we ask that you be with us to guide our thinking to help us to continue to support and love one another in our communities and to be sources of light and hope to our brothers and sisters who struggle in any way. Help us to be loving companions to one another on life's journey. Amen. Amen. So when I got home last Wednesday night, I'm still on the email list for the newsletter of a congregation that was very involved with in Houston. And um, the newsletter included a letter from the church council. Ironically, that congregation is going through a similar process that we are to discern whether or not they need to make a more publicly visible uh, statement that when we say all are welcome, we really mean all are welcome. And so I, I printed out the letter from the church council leader, and I want to share a couple of paragraphs with you. His name is John, John Frey Lloyd and his husband is Sean, and Sean is a he. And John Frey Lloyd and I worked together very closely for a couple of months when they had to transition between the former pastor had moved on to other things, and the interim pastor was not available yet until he finished up an interim where he was and then took a week or two vacation. So I was what they called the bridge pastor. So John and I worked together very closely, and this is part of a letter that he put in their newsletter last week. As many of you know, I have talked about my personal journey to covenant and the path I have walked with God. I walked away from religion at one point, thanks to a lot of anger and feelings of not being welcome in the church. Here at covenant, I was able to find a home where I felt safe, welcome, and loved. For a member of a minority community, this is not always the case when walking into a new church. Too often, we hear stories of how churches and congregations treat minority groups whether a member of their minority or a member of the LGBTQ community in very negative ways. While I feel with my whole heart that we are a very welcoming congregation, we need to look at who we are and what we stand for. It is with this idea in mind that the council has voted to begin the discernment process of making a visible and public statement of our openness. In a very changing world where we see division and divisiveness everywhere, we need to figure out who are we, what do we stand for, and what are we willing to stand up for? And it goes on with things that are not pertinent to us tonight. But I just thought that really explained my understanding about why we're having these conversations, not to change people's minds, not to say that what you're told your whole life uh, was wrong is now right, 
but to say, but we want to be a welcoming community and we want people to be obviously aware that we're a welcoming community. I, I don't know, I've been a member of this church about a year and a half now. My first Sunday here was Reformation Sunday 2023, four, no, not four, <laughs> two, a while ago. Uh, and, I can, and I'm a pastor, so I'm used to being in and out of a lot of churches, but it's intimidating to walk into a strange place and have no idea how you're going to be received. Uh, and a lot of people just won't take that risk. So what I understand we're trying to do is to kind of put a statement out ahead of time on the website, which in this day and age is where most people go to get the information about the address and the time of worship and maybe cruise around and look at some other things, uh, to kind of put out the welcome mat um, through the uh, Wi-Fi before they actually pull into the parking lot. Last weekend, I went over to um, a small town south of Zanesville called Duncan Falls. I have ancestors buried in a cemetery there, and I was doing some genealogy research at the library across the street, and I came upon this statement that was written in 1908, and the context is the European settlers had been all up and down the East Coast, and they were now starting to move further and further west. And in the very late 1700s and early 1800s, they breached the Appalachian Mountains and were coming into the Ohio Valley in larger and larger numbers. And part of what they were trying to do was get away from some of the restrictions that they had experienced on the East Coast. So the 1600 crowd was trying to get away from England, and the 1800 crowd was trying to get away from the East Coast, and so on and so forth. But I, I thought this statement really spoke well to what uh, we're up against. Religion was compelled to adapt itself to the economic life and political ideas of the time and place. Social pressure was exerted to preserve the interest of the whole community. That was written by a fellow named Robert Shattuck, who was a professor at Columbia University, and he published that in 1908. So that brings us to tonight and looking at some New Testament texts. I learned from Stacy a couple weeks ago that some church scholars call these texts that we're looking at um, the, um, mm -hmm, I just lost the word, the uh, clobber, the clobber texts, because they're so often used to clobber people uh, and try and beat them into submission and to living the way we think they should live and thinking the way we think they should think. And so we're gonna dive into the clobber text for a little bit here tonight. But I wanna say a little bit about my understanding of scripture before we do that. So there are many churches who teach the philosophy, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, I don't find that very helpful because the Bible is not one book. It was written over centuries. It's 66 books. I'm an author. I know about different kinds of literature and I don't try to make a I don't try to get a poem to tell me how to get from here to um, Cleveland. I look to a map to do that. The poetry inspires me and may motivate me to decide I want to go up to Cleveland where I grew up, but it's not a roadmap. So we have to let the Bible speak for the way it was written. Who, who wrote it? Why did they write it? Who did they write it to? What were the issues they were addressing? And none of it, not one word of it, was written in English for 21st century people living in North America. They had no idea North America even existed. So we, we have to go through the tedious task, I think, of translating and trying to figure out what were they addressing back in that day. So it'd be wonderful if life was certain, if it was always right or it was always wrong. And once we learned that, we never had to rethink it or relearn it again, but that's not how life goes. Even in the world of science, Scientists come up with a, a theory about something based on a lot of research and a lot of collaboration with colleagues, and they publish papers and say, this is the way it is. And then new information comes along and they reconsider and think, well, we thought it was this way, but now we're wondering if it might not be that way. It doesn't mean they don't know what they're doing. It means that they're open to new ideas and new information coming in. And it's the same with biblical scholars. It's not that they don't know what they're doing is that they have done more research and they have come up with new information and so they are rethinking what they have assumed was the way that it was for a long time. All right, so last week we looked at uh, Leviticus 18.22 and Pastor Carl pointed out that these were part of the Holiness Code 
It was kind of a guidebook for how to get along with each other in community, how to be God's chosen people, what God's expectations of his community was. And a lot of the references to the um, sinfulness and the abomination that we have labeled homosexuality was actually uh, equally offensive to the Greeks and the Jews and any other culture in that area at that time. It was referencing adult, mostly men, being predators of younger children. That's what people were so upset about because the child did not, was not able to give consent. Um, it, it was a great imbalance of power and it still is today. It's still a huge problem with sex trafficking and I don't know if you've done any reading on that or not, but it's, it's really a horrible, horrible situation and many young children are subjected to it. So the Leviticus text is written uh, as kind of house rules for God's people and we need to, to let that apply to the people who lived in that time and era and were trying to live in the community back then and not just transplant it to our time and our community without doing some digging into the meaning of some of those words, which is what we're going to do a little bit tonight. So the first text we're going to look at is Romans 1, 26 through 27. Do you all have Bibles in the pews in front of you? No. no. Well, that would have been too easy. Okay. <laughs> then you will just have to listen to me read it to you, okay? I'm sorry, I didn't realize until late this afternoon that I had not given you a copy of these texts. So, um, and my notes are pretty well organized, but I'm gonna need a second here to find the actual reading because I have lots of comments about it. Here we go. Romans um, 26 through 27. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the, man, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Well, that sounds pretty clear, but we need to go back again. So Paul wrote this, by the way, I think it's worth pointing out that all of these texts that we've read were written by mortals, human beings like you and me, who I believe were divinely inspired to write what they wrote, but I do not believe that God had a megaphone from heaven dictating what they wrote word for word. Uh, so they made choices in the words that they used. They had a specific agenda in mind when they were writing the words. They were definitely trying to influence communities, uh, but it was not God dictating these texts, certainly not in English, uh, to the people who wrote them. So Paul's agenda in writing Romans is to uh, kind of lay out the theology of what is Christianity all about. It wasn't that long ago since the uh, resurrection and the ascension, and the community thought Jesus was coming back any day now, and then the weeks went on, and the months went on, and the years went on, and he wasn't. Uh, so they began to think, well, we've, we've got to form a theology here because who knows how long we're going to be in this situation here between the, the first coming and the second coming. So he's trying to put out a theological framework for people. He makes it clear in the first chapter that both the Jews and the Gentiles are guilty of unrighteous behavior. So he's kind of blasting everybody. To the Jews, who he is one of them, uh, to the Jews he's saying, you should know better. <laughs> you've, you've been taught better. You've got the, the word. You've got, at that point, it was the Old Testament, but you've got the word. You know better. But all the rest of you, you're not doing so well either. And so it's kind of a general reprimand to all of the people that were in earshot of where Paul was preaching at that time. And the point Paul was trying to make is less about the specific deeds that people are doing and more about God wants a relationship with God's people uh, and he does not want to be separated because of sin and unrighteousness and horrible behavior. It's not unlike when you're raising kids and they get into a fight, you really don't care who started it or who said what to who, what you want them to do is stop it. Stop it and get along with each other uh, and figure out some way to resolve your differences that don't involve bloodshed. So that's kind of what Paul is trying to do for these Roman people. They say, what you're doing is not a good thing. And he lists um, 
taking somebody else to court instead of selling it within your own community as one of those sins. We don't ever accuse people who are going to court of, of doing abominable things. We just were, we're a very judicious, is that the right word? Very um, legal oriented society and people sue people all the time over all kinds of issues. But uh, he lists then the, the home, what, he didn't know the word homosexual. He listed same gender sexual relationships as part of an example of how the people are not living up to what he thinks God wants them to be doing. There's quite a bit of historical evidence, or rather lack of it, that same gender sexual activities between persons of the same class did not exist. We, it's hard to prove a case by what you don't find, but there's lots of evidence that people were really upset about the, the power difference between adults preying on children and two adults uh, in a mutually cons consensual relationship. There is no evidence that there is anything written about a, a relationship among equals. So Paul's condemnation imagined nothing like a committed homosexual relationship that we find today. And then he wants to go on and argue that um, what people are doing is not natural. And, and the, the scholars are putting a lot of energy into sorting out what does that word natural mean? And they've come to the conclusion, well, it means two things. There's the creation. There's the world the way God made it. So the sun comes up, the sun goes down. This happens every 24 hours. Although we used to think that the sun went around the earth and the people who challenged that theory got in a lot of hot water with the church a few centuries ago. But the natural order of things is there's the four seasons. You know, we have spring, summer, fall, winter, and that cycle keeps repeating itself. That's the natural world. That's the creation that God set in motion. Then there's natural as in the sense of normal. So, for example, until 1967, intergenerational marriages were illegal in this country. Now, we don't think anything about it. Um, some people may still wonder about that, but it's really pretty common. My uh, daughter, when she was in college, started re raising this name Rudy all the time, and then we found out that Rudy's last name was Flores, and then we found out what Rudy's heritage is, which is not our German English heritage. And I remember having the conversation with my husband at the time thinking, um, we have a choice to make. We either embrace Rudy or we lose Carol. At that point, I had 22 years invested in Carol. I wasn't interested in losing her. So we embraced Rudy, who has turned out to be a wonderful um, husband. Their, their uh, 31st anniversary is today. A uh, wonderful husband, father, son-in-law, son to his parents, brother to his sister. He's just an all-around great guy. But it was unnatural. It was unusual in our family. Uh, pretty much everyone in the family that got married married somebody who have of German English heritage, not because that was dictated, but because that's just how it worked out, until Rudy Flores showed up. Then we talk about normal is what we've experienced in life as normal. So this same young woman, a couple years later, she's celebrating the first Thanksgiving with the entire Flores crew, which numbered about 35. And uh, we were up here in Ohio at the time. She was down there in Houston. And she called me in tears after Thanksgiving dinner. Mom, they ate on paper plates for Thanksgiving dinner. I said, Carol, how many of them were there? Oh, I don't know, I guess 30 or 35 or so. I said, A, nobody who doesn't live in a castle in Europe has a setting for that many people. <laughs> B, who's gonna do all those dishes? <laughs> Well, you know, now over time, that's become normal. That, that feels real normal. But it wasn't normal back then. And that's what some of the scholars are trying to make the point about the issues we're dealing with today, about same gender relationships. We're, uh, we're, we're trying to say whether we think it's right or wrong, we agree or we disagree, we like it or we don't like it. Can we all at least agree that we should not be beating people up? Can we all just agree that they should be welcome and feel safe uh, in our space. That's, I think that's the bottom line we're going for. I interrupt with questions anytime you want to. I don't promise to have the answers, but I will tell Pastor Carl you have a question if I can't answer it. <laughs> Our 
comment, part question, I guess. Uh, ever since I started seeing signs out in front of churches saying this is an inclusive church, that started maybe 20 years ago or so, I wondered what that meant. I, I, think, it may, I think it's referring to homosexuals. I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but my guess is that that really is what Well, that, it's that and, it's not only that. So oh, I, the, I'm sure the, it's more inclusive than that. Well, the ELCA, but, and I don't know how long ago, but quite a while ago now, started intentionally studying these texts again, uh, assigned it to our theologians and our biblical scholars and seminaries to do the research, and started moving towards, well, if we mean you're all welcome, well, why don't we say that you're all welcome in concrete ways? And so there is a movement within the ELCA which is not what Pastor Carl is trying to do here. But there's a movement within the ELCA called RIC, which means Reconciling in Christ, which means we're sorry for all of the ways in which we didn't honor and respect you in the past, and we're trying to make amends. But inclusive also means you don't have to be of German heritage to be welcome in the Lutheran community. You can come from many countries uh, ethnically, and we would like to have you come and join us if you want to come and join us. But so, yeah. I'm quite aware of that. Yeah. Uh, but I still think that back 20 years ago, or whenever that, that, those signs first started, I, I, never, I, was, I never understood what those signs were out there for. I, I came to believe that they were out there primarily to invite the homosexual community in, which amazed me even further. What Christian church would not look Oh, <laughs> lots of them, <laughs> lots and lots of them. Yes, yeah. The far, the far majority of Christian churches. I, yeah, I don't even know numbers. May I finish, please? Yes. Let's take, for example, this Methodist church down the street here, which I understand is no longer Methodist, and I know nothing about them, but I understand there's been a big issue there. There has been. That, and I think they've decided to go the conservative route. We, we, I know we don't have time to go into My guess is that that church would welcome with open arms a homosexual this Sunday morning. I would be shocked if they didn't. I, and I, I don't. That, in I, fact, I would, I, I'm not a betting man, but I would almost bet anything yeah. that that church, if my daughter was homosexual, if she, won't try to, if she tried to go to church there this coming Sunday, they would welcome her with open arms. Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll, with that, with that said, uh, with that said, <laughs> although I think that raises some interesting questions. With that said, though, uh, is that what we're hoping to do? Is to say to homosexuals, gay people, that they're welcome to come in here on Sunday morning, or is there a, a no, more to this agenda? What my uh, understanding, based on my conversation with Pastor Carl is um, the process is to give all of you a chance to be informed about specifically his thinking and then take it to the church council because the church council decides what happens at Messiah. The way your um, laws of incorporation are structured, the church council is in charge of the church. Uh, Pastor Carl certainly has influence, but the church council makes the decisions. Okay. So rather than, because, because some churches have done this very badly, they, um, the church council kind of rubber stamped what the pastor wanted to do. The pastor just kind of overnight said, well, we used to be this way, but now we're this way. Get used to it. Well, that did not set well, and it caused a lot of people a lot of unhappiness, and they wandered off to other places. This, this document, or whatever you want to call it, we're going to, the council is going to get review on these things. Are we, is there more to the agenda than just welcoming in gay people? Because I'm all for welcoming gay yeah. people in, into, the, into this congregation, but there might be some things on that get on that agenda that I'm not in favor of. Well, I, I, I have not. LBGJC, yeah. GJC. Yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. No, no, no. I, 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 I hear you. Yeah. All those letters, uh, and I imagine within that community, they want more than just to be welcomed in. Well, the big conversation the ELCA has been through, the Methodists have been through, the Presbyterians have been through, the United Church of Christ has been through is, it's one thing to say, you're welcome to come and sit in the pew, be quiet. 
we're trying to say you're welcome to fully participate, including having leadership roles in the church as you feel called and as a discernment committee, like the committee that Stacy's working with right now, mutually agrees that, yeah, you have a valid call to be a, a leader in this specific way in this particular community. I have not seen the document, so I can't really comment on what's gonna be in it. Uh, my task was to go over the, the text in the New Testament. So if, if that's okay, we'll move on to the next one. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, the next one is Corinthians, which was written for the people who live in, surprise, Corinth. And Corinth was a big, hustling, urban center with lots and lots of things going on, and some of the things that were going on would have been better left undone. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and I'm looking for the exact text, and here it is, six through nine. No, those are my notes. Hang on a second, people. I apologize. Pastor Carl gave me a lot of data, and I tried to organize it. Okay, here we go. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you used to be. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Okay, well, that also sounds pretty clear. But again, the entire letter to the Corinthians, there were, there were at least two of them, we think there might have been a third one that's been lost over time, was, again, trying to shape them, like the holiness codes did for the ancient people in the Old Testament times, Paul is trying to do that in a new way now for this new community called Christians, uh, although I'm not sure they were called Christians yet, but followers of Christ. He's trying to say, here are going to be the house rules of how we're going to live together. And uh, it's not going well. So he's heard a lot of reports about problems that are going on, and he's addressing them. The thing that Pastor Carl wanted me to point out from this one are some of the Greek words. So we have pornos, which means ones who practice sexual immorality, usually translated as fornicator, often used to refer to male prostitutes, and can describe a host of sexually immoral activities. It's the word from which we get pornography. Plus, he uses the word, uh, forms of this word throughout the uh, rest of the book and does not seem to be here talking about homosexuality specifically, but any kind of sexual immorality, uh, any kind of what we might call loose living, or uh, any kind of infidelity to one's marital partner, uh, or any kind of um, taking advantage of younger people, that sort of thing. Some interpreters take these terms to mean that Paul is referring to both partners in a homosexual relationship and one that acts like a man and the other who acts like a woman. Still others suggest that these were common words describing boys in a relationship with older men and male prostitutes or the male prostitutes and their johns, or we would might call them pimps today. Um, Paul's big thing is what is immoral here is it's non-mutually consensual and it's non-committed relationship. It's, it's lust, un untamed, unregulated, uncontained lust, and that's causing a lot of problems in society. That's what he's really trying to address. And Pastor Carl's note is, the more general we read these texts, the more we see them having to do with our situations today. The more specific we read them, the less they have to do with our culture in this day and age. So I'm not sure if there's more that you want to talk about that, except to say that the people in Paul's age um, were appalled at the idea of what today we call sex trafficking. I'm not prepared to come up with any statistics for you. Um, perhaps Stacy has some information on that, but it's a huge problem. It's largely an invisible problem because the children who are victims of this aren't in a place to tell about it, and the ones who are doing it aren't going to be bragging about it, except maybe to some of their cronies, but uh, it's a huge problem, and it's, it's one that is a great concern to a lot of people who work with children and are hoping that they can grow up healthy. 
It does not condemn same gender relationships in general, but this particular kind of inappropriate abuse of power between people. Comments? More? Less? Okay, we move on. First Timothy. First Timothy uh, 1, verses 8 through 10. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it legitimately. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, and for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for all those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me, to Paul. So I don't know Paul personally, obviously. Uh, um, from what I've read of Paul and about Paul, I suspect he had a pretty healthy ego. And I think once he decided that something was, this is the way it was, he was pretty adamant that he was right. I'm not sure he invited a lot of other people to have um, different opinions. But uh, Paul wants to make the point that the law is good. The law really isn't necessary for people who are law-abiding. <clears throat> and it's, it's only quasi-effective for people who aren't. Uh, that's a problem that we have to the very present moment in our society about who uh, gets to enforce the laws and what do we do with people who simply will not obey them. Um, so th this is human nature. This has been going on since the very beginning of time. There are those who will be compliant and cooperative and watch out for their neighbor and not intentionally do anything to hurt their neighbor. And there are others who choose not to live that way. So Paul is trying to say that uh, we need the laws uh, and we need that to keep the community together and whole. So um, we go back to the two words, the, the pronos and the arsenokoitis, uh, are words that are often used here to translate as fornicators and sodomites. There are strong arguments uh, that, that translate pornos and arsenokoitis and a third word that I'm going to struggle to say, andropodistus. Anybody here speak Greek besides? <laughs> right. So you don't know that I'm saying this all wrong. Good. OK. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> you're just glad you're not up here, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes those words are used to, uh, to, uh, for the same word as kidnapping. Kidnapping was very common. Uh, in this community, in, in this time and place. People were constantly kidnapping people for various reasons. And one of the things that was happening was they were kidnapping children, particularly little boy children, and uh, basically selling them to the highest bidder to appease the appetites of rich old men who could afford to buy them. Uh, so Paul is really trying to say, yeah, that ain't gonna fly. We, we can't do that, that's really wrong more than he's trying to say that people in a committed relationship, um, that's not the issue. Um, Paul probably didn't like it, but that's not what he was really focused in on. He was focused on, you can't go around abusing children that way, it's just not good. All right, we well, all need to ask some more questions. Uh, can you go into more detail of how you're coming up with the pedophiles and, and all that from the readings, because I'm not following. Does that make sense? Not that I'm not agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah. I'm just trying to have it make sense. Does we're, we're going back to the Greek language in this particular case. Mm -hmm. The original scriptures were written in Hebrew, Arabic, and then Greek, as the, as the Greek world took over more and more, and then later into Latin, as the Roman Empire took over, and Latin was their language of choice. And it wasn't until a couple hundred years later that we started translating the Latin into what we call the vernacular. Uh, like Martin Luther translated it into German, the language of the people, and other people translated it into English, and so on and so forth. All those editors had to make a decision on what they thought that word meant. And they would not necessarily have had the research tools that we have today. They didn't have the ability to 
uh, confer with people who live far, far, far away, except by written messages back and forth. They could take forever to get back and forth. So they did the best they could with what they knew at the time. Well, now we're in a different century. We have instant communication anywhere on the globe. So we can have scholars working together and saying, well, I think this means this. I think it's referring to this situation in the culture at the time. And somebody else will say, well, I, I wonder if it doesn't mean this. By the way, I meant to say earlier, um, if you ever have a chance to go to Italy, make sure you go to some of the museums. You will see very graphic illustrations on pottery and murals and paintings of same gender sexual activity. It's very graphic. It leaves nothing to the imagination. So it was very common in that culture. So these words uh, are Greek for the sake of these texts, and they've done a lot of archeological work research. Uh, they've done a lot of trying to interpret ancient manuscripts and, and trying to put the best translation on it that they can. The word homosexual does not show up in the English Bible that we have been using in this country uh, until 1946. And it was an English guess at what those words pornos and uh, the other words that I threw at you that I wasn't sure I pronounced right. Um, they're, they're guessing. I mean, they're educated guesses, but they're guessing. So it's scholars that have, re, have been reinterpreting the, the Bible and where you're getting that. Say that again. Is it you're, so that what you're, you're saying the interpretation is, it's from scholars that yes. are rereading yes. the stuff and educational scholars yes. or whatever. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying to find like all of a sudden I was not yeah. getting from that yeah. to here. Yeah. 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 So. I'm not making this up. Yeah. This is no, scholars. No, no. I didn't think you were. <laughs> I was just trying to understand. I'm not that smart. I'm yeah. like, I'm a black and white person. So. Okay, just a second because I think Stacy had this, something to say. I was just going to say, in my seminary, um, when they speak about Greek words, and they're, and they're going back to as, as far back as they can to the original word, because everybody wants to know exactly what does this mean? And what did it mean in their, their culture? What did it mean in their language? Um, who are they speaking to? All of those are, are considered. What's interesting is that there are nine specific Greek words that specifically speak to male-on-male -male sexual uh, intercourse. None of those nine words that are very specific, Paul uses. One that you mentioned has an economical tie to it. So we're talking about prostitution. We're talking about contracts that were pretty uh, common back then for adult men to have a preference for young prebescent boys. That was a Roman Greco normal contract that was occurring that was offensive and ungodly and Paul was speaking to. That was one of the three Greek words you mentioned. There was an economic sort of tie into it, sort of what we see now in our day as sex trafficking. So it's, um, it's, there's an economic tie in that with the exploitation and manipulation uh, and abuse of children specifically. So, and then there's also one of the Greek words has to do with a femininity. So the offensiveness there in a Greco-Roman world had to do with imbalances between gender. And so, um, but, but what is really interesting to, to me and instructional for me in seminary is learning that there are nine other very specific Greek words that... Um, their culture would have known when Paul used those particular words specifically as homosexual sex between two men. And he, none of those words were used in scripture. And the New Testament is written in Greek. So the fact that Paul wasn't using those words, he's using the ones with an economic tie. He was using the ones for lust, um, multiple partners, also idolatry was um, part of one of the words that you mentioned um, in the definition for a Greek word. The adultery side of the Greco-Roman world in, um, in worshiping, it, there was an element to um, like 
multiple sects. It was a part of the worship. These are the things that were highly offensive to Paul that he was speaking to. Those were the Greek, the Greek words that he chose in, in these texts. Another thing, and then I'll take your question, Richard. Another thing that I don't know if it's going to clarify or make things muddier, but Paul was writing in a country that was occupied by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire standard of um, society was um, that you had men had to be strong and powerful and warriors and compassion and any man that would have had feminine kind of qualities would have been um, very unpopular among the Roman uh, leadership. Uh, they wanted their men to be warriors. They wanted them to go out and conquer the world. And they did. I mean, they got all the way up to England. They were phenomenal. Uh, and then they died. But the, it, it, the part of the, how the Christian church grew so rapidly in the first century was because the Christians, they would put people who were sick or too weak to be of any use to them anymore, they put them on an island out in the middle of the river and just left them there to die. The Christians would go over there at night and take food to them and tend to them as best they could. If they were capable of it, they would bring them back into their own homes. And word got around that these crazy Christians are taking these people in. If a family wanted a male heir and the wife was so unfortunate as to bear a female, they just put the baby out of the curb because it was all about power and strength and, and all of that kind of thing. So Paul is writing in that context and trying to counter some of that, which I think, I know I've digressed from the assigned text for tonight, but I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, I'd like to move past a little bit of the scholarship. Suffice it to say, in the, I'm pretty old, in my lifetime, homosexuality, same-sex love, male, female, no negative, was unacceptable. Right. Okay. And it was not uh, accepted in normal denominational Christian churches. There has been an effort in the last 20, 25 years or so to analyze this. There's been this scholarly discussions about that what would have ultimately amount to this binding and unbinding. Mm -hmm. But let's put it, what Richard was trying to get at, what's the practical, the rubber meets the road here? I, and I have... Okay, go ahead. My thought is that we've had this discussion two or three times in the last 10 years, maybe 15 years, and uh, our branches of the ELCA voted not to do certain things. But if we're going to say welcoming gay people, I have no problem. Richard has no problem. If we're saying that flamboyant gays can flop around here, I'm probably not comfortable with that. Okay. If we're saying that people who come here in committed relationships who are gay are acceptable, I don't have a problem with that. What I might have a problem with that I don't understand, my thinking's not totally formed on this, is where do they stand in, in relationship to the sacraments? We only have three. To, to who? Sacraments. Oh, sacraments, okay, okay. yeah. Okay. So let's say marriage. Mm -hmm. They want to come forward and be married here in the sanctuary because they're committed and they want to have a marriage. Here before, that's not been an acceptable practice. Mm -hmm. So the rubber meets the road here in this statement or this consensus or these divergent views that we give the council to try and come up with something. And I think you have to be just talk about the practical applications of it here and now, and what does that mean for this congregation? Yeah, okay, I think that's what Pastor Carl wants to talk about next week. And a question? Okay. First of all, I'm uncomfortable talking in front of people. I'm on the shy side, but. This whole thing kind of upsets me. It's not that I don't accept homosexuality. I'm fine, absolutely fine. Let me repeat this. I am fine with homosexuality. What I am not fine with is 
actively going after the LGBTQ whatever group. Okay? To me, that smacks of political correctness. I think, I think that when it comes to homosexuality, it should be a non-issue. The church should not care whether you're homosexual or not, just as much as they don't care whether I like Fords or Chevys or Coke or Pepsi. Mm -hmm. We are a welcoming church, and what upsets me is <clears throat> there are conservative members in this congregation. If you actively go after the LBGQ whatever, yeah, that community, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. you will have people leaving this congregation. Make no mistake about that. There's a new member, relatively new member, that came from Epiphany Lutheran Church, and he told me that they are pushing this agenda over there. They are putting the rainbow colors on their welcoming name tags. Mm -hmm. And essentially, what he's saying is they're trying to shove it down their throat. Yeah. I don't like things shoved down my throat, and I don't, again, I don't speak for the council, and I don't think there is a paper yet. I, I think this is supposed to be laying the foundation for some education, and then the council will be wrestling with this, and then I, I presume it'll be presented to all of you again in some form or another. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's gonna go to a vote or not. I'm not that familiar with the inner workings of this congregation. Uh, I do know, I don't like having things shoved down my throat. I don't think we're trying to send out engraved invitations that say all of you who identify with the LGBTQ community, you all come. I think what we're trying to say is don't be afraid to come in the door. You're not gonna get beat here. Let me tell you, I have a lot of friends in Houston who are part of the ELCA now because they grew up in churches that said, well, you're welcome if you go through, uh, what's the word I want, Stacy? the, the re conversion therapy, yeah. Uh, or you know, you're going to hell, <laughs> you're not welcome here. They were told this all of their childhood growing up and then somehow they found the Lutheran community and came in and nobody said that kind of stuff to them and they thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna stay here. Um, so it, I, where the line should be, I, I, I don't know, but I do know that society keeps changing. Um, I'm old enough to remember when I went to downtown Cleveland with my grandmother, there were brown water fountains for people of color and white water fountains for people not of color. You don't see those anymore. We finally decided, well, that wasn't a good idea. Um, so we're wrestling with it. We're, we're wrestling with it a lot. And I have to say personally, as a new member of this church, I have a lot of respect for Pastor Carl because he plants seeds. He doesn't just walk out of his office one day and said, I've had an epiphany, now we should do it this way. I, I didn't mean to pick on Epiphany Lutheran Church. Um, <laughs> scratch that. I've had this insight and now we're gonna just do it this way. He doesn't operate that way. He's offering information, trying to shed some light on some scriptures and have a conversation. I think the agenda for next week is kind of, and now what, where do we go from here? Yeah. Other? Comments, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, just as a perspective as a new member. Could, and, could, could you possibly take your mask off long enough to talk? I can. Thank a you. A cold, not COVID. Oh, that's up. fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, just from the perspective of a new member, Pastor Carl in our class was very clear about what the intent of this class was. He wanted new members coming in to know that this was coming around the bend. Um, and his, his, phrasing in that class was to come up with a statement to make sure that anybody that is looking for a church body, a church to attend, who is part of the LGBTQ community would know that they are welcome to come here. Nothing further than that. Um, and I, and with a lot of assurement that this process and this conversation alone will be multi-step and multi-factor. There's always the opportunity. And I think these classes right now are our opportunity to look at why we hold on to the beliefs that we have, why certain things make us uncomfortable or have in the past, and to find if that's really rooted in scripture, like these first two weeks, or if it's in tradition and culture and the past. Um, and with a very respectful challenge, I know even as a, a white woman that's straight, trying to find a new church, there are places I went where I was felt very unwelcome, and I don't, present 
in any way that would stand out in a German background <laughs> church. Um, and a lot of my friends that are in the LGBTQ community feel church has harmed them immeasurably. And so my understanding of this statement is simply to say, if you are to get onto the website for Messiah, you would see something that says you're welcome at the Lord's table. You're welcome in our congregation. Um, and it is, from what I understand, it has not addressed any of the sacraments and that that's not Parl Pastor Carl's other than communion, where we say everybody is welcome at the Lord's table. Um, that's my understanding, just as what, what was presented in the new member class and where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other, others? So we, we move forward with this. Council comes up with some kind of statement. It's introduced to the congregation, and some people really are um, irritated about it and decide to pick up their, their, their stuff and go someplace else. People are constantly changing for all kinds of reasons. You can't manage a, a, an organization of this size on the basis of individual opinions about what we should do because you will never please all the people all the time and there'll be some of the people you'll never please any of the time, but you kind of have to take a path forward and do what you can to keep as many people in the community as possible. But um, people get their feathers ruffled over all kinds of things and go someplace else. Which is fortunate that we have as many different churches as we do, as many different denominations as we do, as many different Lutheran churches right here in the Columbus area as we do, because I can tell you I've been in a lot of churches. My last call before I retired was I was church-wide staff, and I was charged with doing capital campaigns for churches, and that put me in different congregations at least two times per campaign and a lot of conversation before and during and after the campaign. And there are no two Lutheran churches alike. We may follow the same order of service. We may sing the same hymns. We may say the same version of the Lord's Prayer. But every church has its own kind of DNA, its, its own climate, its own feel to it when you walk in. And I understand what we're trying to do is just to say, we just want you to know that we think you should check us out because we think you're going to feel at home here. That's, that's our goal. That's, that's all I got. So, yes. What Christ has taught me is that those people who would welcome gays with loving, open arms, and those people who would shut the door on gay people, what Christ has taught me is to love them all. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think it was you that referenced about, but well, what are we going to do if they come in here, you know, dancing down the halls and wearing outrageous outfits and behaving really appropriately? Well, I think I'd get handled the same way we'd address anybody else who maybe came in on a drunken terror and was disrupting worship, uh, was intimidating people. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know how that would get handled exactly because I haven't seen it happen here. But in this day and age, uh, what if someone comes in with a gun? Lots of churches have had to deal with that one. It's so it, there, there is not going to be one size fits all, but th things just keep changing. And then we have to kind of decide what's the bottom line, non-negotiable, this does not change, and everything else is up for grabs. And for me, in my reading of scripture, the non-negotiable is God is love, God loves God's people, and God would like God's people to love each other. And when they don't, then we have to deal with them <laughs> somehow or other. <laughs> I'm one of the longest members still at this church and over the years I know we've talked about and it's even entered my mind what if some flaming person come into the church you know how are we going to react to that over the years I have had husbands and wives boyfriends and girlfriends whatever sit somewhere around me in one of these pews where I was getting ready to turn around and say, you need to go get a room. I mean, they're not paying attention to the sermon. They're hanging all over each other. I've seen it so many times. It, it, that particular aspect has nothing to do with whether someone is gay or not. And some of those people aren't here, and maybe some of them still are. I don't know. We all go to different services. But it's been in straight lives in churches as well. 
Okay, I think I've oh, got one more back here. Wait, wait, wait for the mic. I hate to ask this question. Um, what about the bathroom situation just needs to be, the question needs to be arised, like it needs to come up and it needs to be discussed um, on that. So, cause that is a big deal all over the news you hear things that happen. Um, cause even somebody in my family is now a boy. So we specifically yeah. did not go to a school because we could tell they were gonna say negative things and we can't do that with my nephew and teach my kid that. So, but I'm not comfortable with the biological male in the bathroom with me. Okay, so you have just raised another whole So that, I don't wanna like get into it. Issue, I just say that should but, be on um, discussion yeah, later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, the Bible says zero about it because it wasn't, I know. It wasn't possible. Second of all, uh, I have seen documentaries where some people, I mean, very, 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 very tiny percentage of people, but some people naturally or without any artificial uh, intervention switch from one to the other. It's really rare, but I've right. read that it has happened. That's another whole it's conversation for another night. only if there's an issue, night. usually yeah. it's not, yeah. but if, if something would occur, but... Um, we don't need to be blatant about it either, because like yeah. I'm sure it doesn't happen often. Yeah. But I know that is something that is part of the protesting. Yeah. Um, and I understand yeah. why there's different opinions on it. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, but I don't have time to tackle that one tonight. <laughs> I, I have the mic. I'd like to say something. You have the mic. Say it. <laughs> um, two, two things are on my mind. One, going back to our statement is inclusive and we say all are welcome. Unfortunately, from what I've heard, when someone is in a minority group, whatever minority group that is, and they're looking for somewhere to go, seeing the word all is welcome doesn't really mean that anymore. <clears throat> the, the Lord created the, the earth and he said it was good. Now if I say to someone that's good, they look at me and go, yeah, but it's not great. <laughs> it, good used to be good enough to be great. And what I'm trying to say is all doesn't mean all anymore. And when someone's in a minority group and they want to go somewhere and know that they're going to be loved, and probably more important, know that they're going to be safe, they're looking for something specific to say, this group of people have thought about you and are willing to commit to when you come to us, you will be safe. Because just saying all, unfortunately, doesn't cover that anymore. Lots of places say all are welcome, and when you come through the door, yes, all are welcome, and here's how we need you to change so that mm -hmm. you're one of the all. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. that's a, a piece of an affirming statement to say, we have thought about this issue, we've done some education to know how to interact with people who are hurting, who have been hurt, who need love, and when you come here, you'll be safe. Um, and the only other thought I had is, yeah, it's going to be challenges. There'll be challenges, physical challenges. What do you do as far as bathroom and safe spaces and different things like that? But I think if we start with the premise of God is love, we're called to love, we'll be able to overcome the physical challenges. I don't want to get from a position of we can't love because we have a physical challenge. So I'm sorry, we've, we've been stopped. That's, that's not us. That's not God's people. We'll figure out the physical challenges. I am an old Methodist, and I have been a part of many, many, many churches, and I have viewed many churches from the outside, and I say this without hesitation. This is the most welcoming church I have ever been a part of. That's all I have to say. Okay, let's, um, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
Amen. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your coming and your attention and your comments.